Okay, everybody, so, so welcome. Um, today, what my plan is, is to take you through our, our the, the ELT RMS, which is the English Language Teaching Research Mentoring Scheme. I'm gonna give, so if we look at what we're gonna cover today in the webinar, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to the scheme. Uh, we'll have a quick little introduction to the desirable areas of inquiry. And then Rama and I are gonna take you through the application form and the different sections in the application form and the kinds of things you need to be thinking about or that need to be included in the different section. Now, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So after each section, you'll have an opportunity to, to ask questions. I think the best way to do it, given the number of people and that we're using this on a video conferencing platform, is that I think it's best managed in the chat. So if you've got any questions as we're going through the slide, then please ask them. And then Rama and I will also give like two minutes after each slide if there are any further questions that you want to, to ask. There's also another opportunity at the end of this presentation for, for you to ask questions. So feel, feel free, use this as an opportunity to mine us for, for information, as this is, like your, this is your opportunity to, to do that. So any clarity that you need or any doubts that you're having, this is your opportunity to, to solve or resolve them. Okay, so to, to get started, so what is ELT RMS? Well, it's a 12 month scheme that we will provide funds to, to ELT researchers and we've got funds of up to two and a half thousand uh, pounds. We'll also be running an induction workshop in May and, uh, and that will be for one and a half days. Now this induction will include an orientation to the scheme in terms of expectations and also an opportunity to get to know each other, um, have a focus on research methodology, and also to kind of present and peer review what each of you are gonna be doing over the next 12 months. And then once that induction is passed, then there'll be monthly mentoring support from an ELT specialist and a, a British Council Senior Academic Manager. Now this support will be given through webinars and one-to-one -one sessions with, with either the British Council support or with the ELT specialist. And again, this will be spread over the 12 months. So you really do have an opportunity to get feedback on your work, to get insights into your research and you know, a further supporting mechanism. And at the end of the scheme, an there'll be an opportunity to present your research. At the moment, this is very much in the tentative stages, but we're planning that it'll either be in a national conference or if possible, in an international conference for you to showcase your learnings and findings. I think the circulation of knowledge is really, really important. And I think when you are conducting research, it's really important that it doesn't stay isolated in a, in a little corner, that we spread the message wide and far. So that's a very important part. And when we look at a certain section in the, in the application form, we'll go into more detail there. So I think the aims of the program are, are pretty clear from, from our perspective and what we would like to try and achieve over the next 12 months. So I think it's really important and the British Council really wants to be facilitating and strengthening the quality of ELT research in India. I think we're also very keen to provide an opportunity for researchers like yourselves to investigate and document you know, ELT practices. What's going on in the country? What are people doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And getting you know, much more contextual knowledge across the country. I think we're also very keen to promote the establishment and maintenance of research links between professionals and policy makers in India. I'm sure you're all very, very aware about the importance of having an evidence-based approach to policy making and design and of course implementation. So the more evidence we have, the more power we have to shift and make positive change. And I think also it's really important that 
that we create a professional community, community that we are a network of ELT practitioners, and it's important that we know each other, what each other are doing, so we can champion each other, support each other, and advocate each other's work. So it's a great opportunity for this as well. I'm going to make the assumption here that nobody has any questions that they would like to ask me uh, in this section. Rama's talking. I need to unmute you. Hang on. Sorry. Okay, go, Rama. There's one question by Anna. Uh, are they going to be, well, how many will be chosen? So, uh, Jemima, I think it's best to answer it. Okay, right. so I've got, I've got funds mm. of up to £30,000 that I can spend. So there'll be, so what we will do is you can have an award up to 200,500 and that's the ceiling that we go to. And then obviously on top of that uh, award, you'll have a travel bursary that will enable you to come to the induction workshop and your accommodation and your travel will all be taken care of. So that will be like a bursary on top. So it really depends, how many awards, I mean, it really depends on the application. Some people might be asking for 2,000, some people might be asking for 1,800. It will, it will all depend. So I can't, I can't say exactly, but I imagine no more than 10, which is a really nice group to do, you know, real in-depth work, I think. Any other questions? There is one more, I think, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Ram, are you on chat duty? Um... I, I don't understand the question. Uh, does that even output? Can you hear me? Yeah, go for it, Anna. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, so with this uh, 2,500, yeah, does that include, like, there's this uh, element of the research output? So other than it, if it is like a product, like a book or something like that, it, does that involve everything that goes into that? Or is it the pure research part? No, it will cover it will cover most things. When we get to the costing side of things, we'll go through the different breakdowns and you'll see where it is for personnel. And then there is a budget line for dissemination. And I'm gonna and before that slide, we'll look at different things that you can do for dissemination. To be perfectly honest with you, I think the best way to disseminate and research supports it is through face-to-face -face interaction. So I think we will be looking very positively right. Right. on dissemination plans that include face-to-face -face work, much more than producing a journal article. I mean, that's great, okay. but it really restricts yeah. the breadth and depth of where it can go. Mm -hmm. so, so are we talking about all this culminating into some big conference where everything gets uh, showcased? Is it like that? Or did, I mean, just trying to get to Maybe, maybe. I mean, we're, I mean, we're looking at doing our budget for, for next year around our thought leadership work. So there is an item along alongside that, but there's also discussions going on between places within the UK and also here about potentially doing some sort of conference. But I don't want to set everything up. Oh, of course. I, ideally, we're hoping for for an international conference. I think the bigger platform we can give you, the better it is for us, and more importantly for you. So you know. Obviously, we're going to try and champion and, you know, push you as high and as far as we can. Thank you. Uh, will it be individuals who will be considered for the uh, grant or can teams uh, apply? Can we join with someone and then do a combined research? Yes, you can, but there will, one of you will have to take a lead and you'll be, I mean, we're going to look at that in one of the other sections, but you would be, you need to have a principal researcher. So that would be our contact point. But of course, you can do it in partnership with an institution. You can do it in partnership with, with another academic, in partnership with a local organization. That, that's all important. But you do need to have a lead, a lead researcher. Well, uh, what are the major areas where research is uh, uh, aimed at? Okay, so let me move on to, to the next slide because hopefully that will answer your question a little bit. Um, okay, something's gone a bit weird there. All right, so I think as you would have noticed on the, on the webpage, so we have um, the British Council 
in all of our work, we have what we call um, our insight and innovation work. And our insight and innovation work, we've identified priority areas for us that, that we might take a more evidence-based approach in because they're kind of emerging, they're nascent, and they're, they're definite areas of inquiry. So key areas that we're interested in are assessment, assessment of English and assessment of 21st century skills. We're also interested in using technology to learn with English, so whether that's through online platform, MOOC, self-actors, uh, schools, institutions that are taking a blended approach to their learning. I think this is also, the next point is very pertinent for, for the Indian context because it's around English for specific purposes. So I know I'm quite aware of a lot of higher education institutions, for example, that are focusing on engineering or focusing on... So again, I think that's another excellent area of inquiry to kind of build our knowledge and understanding of these areas. And of course, the really fizzy topic at the moment is around, you know, it, employability skills, developing soft skills, all of that. But there is a real dearth of literature around what's working, what's not working. And it's very evident from, you know, kind of the way it's all patched work together across the states that hasn't really taken a very evidence-based approach. So I think there's a real need there to collect, to collect evidence. Then of course, we've got our, you know, the things that I think the British Council here is very well known for, which is around teacher education and development. These are still strong areas for us. I think particularly around the work that we're doing, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Um, like, so for me, I'm very interested in reflection. You know, what are we doing to develop reflection? Because for me, that's a key pillar in terms of teacher development. And what are the gradations between those who are good reflective thinkers? Does that make them better teachers and so forth? So I think there's lots of really interesting stuff there. Of course, another area which I think, again, there's a dearth of literature, particularly here in India, is around inclusive education practices. The British Council is getting quite a lot of inquiries around how to cope with children with special educational needs, whether they're coming from socio-economic, challenging socio-economic backgrounds, or whether they have dyslexia and things like that. So how are those, what's going on there in terms of the teaching and learning of English? And then, of course, an, an area which is very pertinent for, for India and quite political as well is around using multilingual practices for the teaching and learning. There's lots of different things going on here, particularly in the private sector and in the government sector are following in terms of, you know, introducing EMI schools at primary levels across blocks and clusters. And again, that's a very new area. So these are the areas that we're interested in now. Just because we're interested in these areas does not mean that you have to do these areas yourself. So, so I'm just going to move all of that. So if you've got other areas and other concerns, you know, feel, don't feel that you have to kind of peg yourself underneath our areas. It's just a bonus for us uh, if you do, because then we can take you know, the base approach to our interventions, to our thought leadership work and how we engage if you think there's an area that doesn't come under that, that is really rooted to your local context, then by all means, go ahead with that. Don't think, don't shape it for us, do it where you think the need is. Okay, any questions there? Right. Uh, what will be, is there any basic uh, education qualification for an applicant required? Hmm. Rama, what's been your experience here? Um, definitely, uh, teachers at the primary level, I mean, any level, whatever their qualification would be, would be eligible. But if you have got some kind of a master's in ELT or a related area like education, then you would also have some, uh, you know, some idea of how to do research. I think that would be really an added advantage. Uh, if you have already done some research, then that even adds further to, you know, your, the possibility of your being selected or being able to produce a good proposal. So in terms of the actual qualification, like master's, bachelor's, or post-graduation and all that, I think, I don't think there is any 
any restriction. What 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 do you say, uh, Jemima? I think yeah, saying teachers are eligible. Yeah, I think of course teachers are eligible, but you've also I think as Rama said, you're going to produce a, a better application if you have experience in doing research because the application form is asking for some quite. We need to see evidence that you're able to put together put together a coherent research plan with uh, within a conceptual framework uh, that has um, you know clear stages in terms of methodology, from, you know who you, who you're going to be working with, how many people, what tools you're going to use, what kind of analysis you're planning on doing, and you know obviously people. Have more research type background are going to be at an advantage but that shouldn't feel if you are in a beard that if you feel that you've got the knowledge to put together a good piece of research of course then that's fantastic and go for it remember that it, that is a, that it is a mentoring scheme I, I don't think into the into the program up to your eyes with the doctoral pieces of research and what happened. I'm just muting people as I go, sorry. Um, uh, if I may add, uh, Jemima. Yeah. Uh, I think if you feel uh, unsure of what kind of study to do and how much money to cost, it might be a good idea to do a small bit of research and ask for not a huge amount, huge as in 2,000 pounds or two, 2 lakh rupees. Maybe you can think of a small study with a small budget and then I think that will give you experience of uh, you know, doing this and then next, you can, next time you can move on to a slightly bigger research study. So I'm saying if, if you haven't got earlier experience and you don't feel all that confident, then it might be a good idea to do a modest kind of a proposal with, with uh, not too many things, too many demands on it. And therefore, automatically, the money that you will require would be less. So that might be one of the ways of approaching it. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to the next slide now, which I didn't realize was already there. So the application form. So one of the first things that you need to do on the application form is you need to tell us who you are. So one of you already mentioned, you know, can more than one person be on the proposal? Yes, you can, but you will need, there will need, one of you will need to be the lead, the lead researcher. And that will need to be very clearly articulated because that will be our initial point of contact. You also need to really specify who the agreement, if you're successful, who the agreement will be made with. Will it be made with you or will it be made with the institution that you're working in? And it's important when you, if you are naming other researchers, they really must have clearly defined roles. Now, when you submit your application, when we're doing our shortlisting process, there might be there might be some back and forth that we might see some potential in things. So there's a possibility that we might call people up and say, well, given the scope of your project, we don't necessarily see that there's a role for everybody here. So you might want to cut back this, and you might want to add that, and so forth. But you know, it's very. If you are having other researchers with you, it's very important that we understand who they are and what their role is. And also, when we come to look at um, costing, you know, are they going to be quite prohibitive? Are they expensive? Are you finding ways in which you can communicate to work together that isn't going to involve travel and so forth? Is there anything you want to add here, Rama? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Rama, this is you. Do you want to introduce this idea? Okay. Um, now, the first sort of in the application, it is asking you for a project summary in about 250 words. I don't know how many of you have seen the application form, but then it begins, your project proposal begins with a summary of your project, uh, which you need to restrict to 250 words. Um, uh, we had some kind of an example. Can you go on to the summary? We, we have got two examples of two project summaries. We would like you to quickly read through this. Uh, this is the first one. The topic is self-regulated strategy development for improving letter writing skills of engineering students. And there's a next one. 
uh, now you need to read one after another and and we thought it might be a good idea to ask you which one do you think is a pr good project summary so shall we do that task quickly can you all read this first one and sort of keep this in mind because i don't think we can show two slides at the same time right uh, jemima that's beyond my uh, te technology skill okay. <laughs> so read through this and think of what what are good points about this and see if this is a good one basically you have to say which one is a better one so can you do that task now read this two minutes Shall I move on to the next the next summary? Is everybody ready? Just wait. For it. Okay, I'm going. Okay, the second one. How's, every, how's everybody doing? Can I go yes. to the slide with our questions on? Okay, yeah. let's go. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Um, okay, Ka, which one is better? So what's your answer? Ma'am, the second one is better. Okay. Why? Why, yeah. Because for me, the what, why, and how of the research mm. is clearer in this particular summary. Because whenever we think of research, three things come to my mind. What is it that you want to investigate? Why and how? So, to me, the three things, I can find these three things in this particular summary. Which or you don't find it in the second one? Or you do? Yeah, which I find it in the second one. The what, why and how of research. I see. And the first one? First one, First one is, is, is little vague to me, you know. How many of you feel that way? Is it possible to get a show of I feel the other way around, ma'am. I feel that uh, first one has got all the things very clearly for me. Although the second one is more interesting as a research topic, but I feel the proposal is very well made in the first. Um, so just to get... Uh, now, the question is asking, are we chatting or sharing our ideas on audio? You could do either. You could do both. Okay. Uh, 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 even I think the second yeah. one, it gives a theoretical background and then second. what is uh, that the reason, the objectives also very clearly. Okay. Yeah, can I can I uh, make my observation about this? Yeah. Who is this? Yeah. And this is this is Upper Swami. Okay. Uh, I feel uh, the first one has given that a research document should have research proposal should have. In fact, this is a summary, right? A summary, of course. Uh, so we have a general background in the first paragraph mm -hmm. about what is done. We have in the second paragraph some sort of uh, review. Mm -hmm. No references and citations are given there. What has happened 
with with a kind of you know conceptual framework or theoretical framework given there, and the objectives are drawn at the end, uh, and objectives are formulated at the end. So I think this is what goes to make a okay. uh, proposed uh, summary as such. Yeah. Uh, now there is there seems to be a division in terms of one is better and the second <laughs> is better, and therefore now I'll have to say something on that. Definitely. The first one is intended to be better, <laughs> not the second. Why and not the second? Because the second one, can you show me the second one? <laughs> I have something to say about second one if I am allowed to say that. All right. Uh, second one, I mean, they, they, they're trying to promote a method. Mm. Uh, and we also we also the res, the one who applies for a research proposal, research grant must be aware of the current trends and what is going on in the in the, in the literature as such we have gone beyond method yeah. and try to understand that there is, there is no best method of course he is not trying to say that tm is the best but still he is trying to bring in and it is not actually trying to relate it to the context of teaching and he's trying to say that it can be uh, uh, used in a uh, technical context. The idea of language is not coming through translate, uh, translation as a method as such. Right. So, language, so, I mean, from the perspective of something like SFL, mm -hmm. uh, gets uh, to understand that language is actually a, something that evolves in a kind of a context of culture, okay, all that. So I don't want to get into this kind of thought now. Much detail on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to uh, point out here in project summary one and two is that, as you rightly said, as Apaswami rightly said, and even Ekta uh, has said that, there is a context defined in the first paragraph. It's not like you have to define things in particular paragraphs, but then the reader needs to know the context in which the study is being carried out, and then what you want to do and why. Because why is that method? Go to the first one, Jemima, please. Yes, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, this uh, SRSD, very briefly well defined. And then, of course, it's not going into the detail of uh, related literature or anything, but it's, it's uh, pointing to a kind of a gap that exists. It has been tried out on young learners, but not on uh, the kind of the study in question, which is adult learners, undergraduate students. So that's very clear that this is trying it out. It's trying it out at a, on a different kind of sample. And then the third thing clearly uh, says what, what the objectives are, or how, how many things will be done. First, we're going to find out what how letter writing is taught, then how, how effective it is, and then whether SRSD is an effective approach. I think the reader gets a very clear picture of what this whole project is all about. Whereas if you see the second one, can you go to the second one, Jemima? There are lots of presumptions or assumptions made which are sort of taken for granted. And in, if you see, it looks like the, the researcher has already decided what's good. It doesn't look like one needs to do any research. He wants a space for, he or she wants a space for translation method. I'm, I'm not even going into detail about method versus approach and all that stuff. So there's nothing that you are trying to find out. So your project should clearly say, the summary even, should clearly say what it is that you're trying to investigate. There should be something that you don't know, something that you want to understand more something that you want to find out. So that has to clear, clearly come through in all those 200 or 250 words. Even look at the title, role of translation. What about it? What is this role that you're talking about? It's a <coughs> translation method. So there is a kind of uh, cheating going on. You call it role of translation, but in this uh, translation method, which he's convinced is, is very good, he's not going to get, out, get rid of it but he's going to somehow make provision for it. So there is, see, seems to be some kind of a closed mindedness about this whole research, so which is not, not a very good thing. Also, it's sort of just, uh, repeating, the ideas are by being repeated, it's not put into clear paragraphs or there are no clear, there's no clear structure. And therefore the first one is there. If you have any questions, you strongly disagree, 
can you can type it in and we'll take it up later uh, but otherwise you will go ahead so i hope we were able to in the second case the intervention we are planning is not clear that's correct and in the first proposal yep. which gap is established exactly yeah so you can type in more such it should be neutral in the app that's right exactly you're right should should go into it in a kind of an open ended way open mindedness you can't be partisan you can't be biased towards one even if you are then you say i i strongly feel that this is what it is but i want to find out if it's really true in in the real situation that's how a researcher approaches uh, approaches even something that's been well established translation is going on everywhere but what is happening and how should it be so that those should have been the questions it's not that this can't be a study what is implied in the project summary it can't be that it's not a, it's, it's not that it can't be a study but it's not properly worded maybe as a as a you know a, an activity you could reword this think of a study that can be done and maybe submit it to us and we'll look at it at some point yeah there'll be a recording available and you can watch it at leisure <coughs> is that okay yeah i'm going to go on to the next slide which kind of just summarizes what you said yeah. but i realize yeah. the animation is is yeah. not good, so i'm apologizing for this yeah so what are the qualities and features from summary 1 can you take and apply to the writing of your summary the context is clear the rationale is clear it has a narrow focus be very careful when you're thinking or in conceptualizing what you want to do you just have 12 months it sounds like a long time but you're going to be working doing your normal day to day professional life so it it's not really a very long time so you don't want to be you know casting a wide net you want to be very focused on what you want to do and one of the key takeaway from summary one is the reader gets a clear idea about what the project what the project's about who the participants are what the level they are you don't need to go into the depth you just need to keep it at a on a surface level and rama and i were talking earlier that the project summary should be you do a little draft of one at the beginning but that should be one of the last things you do before finalizing your proposal is looking at everything that you've put in to make sure that your project summary does what you say you're going to be doing it needs to be a, there needs to be a strong correlation there yeah. so you might it's like when you're writing an introduction for your you know for your work it's normally the thing that you do right at the very end so you should take that as a project Yeah. Is there anything you want to add here, Rama? Or should no, I go into no, the? No, I'm done. But unless people have any specific question on this, if not, we continue. Okay. Yeah. So what comes next in the? So you've got the broad headlines, and then if you look at the following sections, I've called them detailed proposal. And anything that comes under detailed proposal is the main body of your proposal, and you need to use these headings when submitting it. So the first heading under detailed proposal proposal is your statement of research or the problems that you're planning to investigate. So the key things to you know focus on when doing this section is try to avoid jargon as much as possible much as possible so make sure that you describe your research in language that many people outside your specific subject area can understand write as clearly concisely and concretely as you can again as i mentioned earlier be narrow in your focus and again as i mentioned you've got to be realistic given the scheme is 12 months also bear in mind the word count here is important you have just 50 to 100 words so again it doesn't need to be a lengthy wordy statement you know be succinct in what you want to say rama is there anything you want to add here Does anyone have any questions about this part of the of the proposal? Mm -hmm. I agree with Padmini. 
What did Padmini say? I can't, if I open it, it will it's it. also important to remember that the research project will lead to an end of project report. So the clear one, the clearer one is at the beginning, the easier it is to draw and write conclusions. But I just want to add one thing to that. Uh, do keep some provision for the project to evolve over the year. It's not like you are 100% clear at the beginning and you just taking a lockstep method to complete the whole thing because you it sort of develops one one step uh, builds on the other they build on the previous one so there is some some possibility for uh, you know what changing it may be necessary if necessary and so on not in a drastic way but then in a little in a small way so it's not all final so i just wanted to say that yeah that's true I, I agree. Yeah. Sure. Okay then, so moving on to our next slide. Yeah, we'll, we'll answer Jai Kumar's question for in the next slide. Okay. So now we're going to move on to, you know, look, you've got to kind of credit previous research in the area that you're planning to study. So essentially what you need to do in this section is you need to clarify what other studies have said about your research topic and when you've done this you need to indicate to us the reader on how you're building on a previous study or well-established theory and we saw that in summary one they referenced it and saying how they were going to contribute it we've also got to talk about what you know what are you addressing are you addressing gaps in the knowledge that exists are you adding to existing knowledge by doing a study with a different or more complete methodology? And it's really important that you demonstrate how you're applying this conceptual theory into your or relating it to your local context. Remember, that's the main platform that we're interested in is getting as much contextual knowledge as we can. So make sure you've done some reading around your, your planned area. Shall I add something here? Yes, please. Um, yeah, here probably we would expect some understanding of what research has, has happened in the area chosen. Uh, your understanding of that and how you see a kind of a gap or you see a kind of need for your study. It could be, it, it's, it doesn't have to be a kind of, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning research or anything, but then it's, it, it should be one or more of these. It could it, at least be like, the, like that uh, strategy, uh, whatever, the first project summary. They were applying it to a different context. So you can apply that concept of theory in your context and that could also be giving you, that's also research. So here we would like you to show some understanding of existing research. And for this, I have one suggestion. If, some, if, if you are quite new to your area of research or you're new to research itself, then I think one quick way to sort of access research, research and research articles, is is a link given on the on the announcement to uh, this uh, the scheme uh, this this link is to a whole lot of studies done as part of an earlier scheme uh, the british council supported called ltrip awards english language teaching research partnership awards and if you see the link given there it takes you to a whole lot of studies done and published published as in british council has published it so I think that that would be a very good starting point. From there, you can go on to other studies that they have quoted or studies that you come across on by Googling, advanced Googling, whatever, you have advanced search and everything. So you need to spend some time to locate your study in, in that area of research. If you're, a, if, you're, if you're not able to do that, it somehow doesn't carry a lot of weight. So I would strongly recommend that you spend some time out of the next 15 days or so. If you, you will have to spend about two, three days to find out how to locate your study and make it really a need-based one. That's it. 
Does anyone have any questions or would you need any further clarity on anything? Did you all get the link that I was referring to? It's on the announcement, Eltrum's uh, announcement. It says here, click here for studies done. So that, that, that it's done on uh, many, many, in many areas. So that's a very quick kind of a link. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, suppose we have a couple of ideas. Is it possible to uh, do multiple proposals? <laughs> I mean, no, because just just putting it out there. Yeah, but no, I, no, I don't think so. I think just choose one and, and do one. Otherwise, things just get a bit more complicated. Mm. For us and for you. Yeah. Because I wouldn't say you should, the, say that, um, the, time, the time to work on two proposals should be spent on the proposal that you like most and you will have done a much better job. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this was quite tricky for, for me to put together and do it in one slide. So it's quite a binary uh, definition I've had here. And obviously all of this, as you'll see in my opening phrase here, that everything is very much dependent upon your conceptual framework, your research question, your hypotheses. And basically that is going to be the primary influence on the approach that you take. Of course, you might want to do a mixed method approach, which again is absolutely fine. But for the sake of this presentation, and there wasn't enough space in the table for me to add another column about the, you know, what we'd expect in a mixed method approach. But if you've got both the qualitative and the quantitative there, then that will help you kind of take a kind of pick and choose how they're going to complement each other and work through with each other. So get ready for a bit of an overload now. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on this because as I said, it will be dependent upon your research question. But what you're going to see on this table are the sorts of things or the sorts of things that we need to have evidence that you have touched upon or articulated in some way. So if we look at, if you're going for a quantitative approach, which I think, not that we want to dissuade people from doing a, a quantitative approach, but just be very careful in terms of what you're trying to do and the amount of data that you're trying to, to collect and what, you know, what are you trying to do with that data? And how is that going to add to, to our field of knowledge and understanding? Where I think Rama and I talked about that we don't really want to see any pre-test or post-test or stuff like this. Let's have a quick look at the quantitative. So you're going to articulate what your research design is. You're going to have to do a definition, operational definition. So that's a working one, not that it's solidified because that will come as the study goes. But you're going to have your definition of your constructs and your variables in your proposed research model. You're also going to look at the opera, opera, uh, operational <laughs> of the variables, so, you know, survey questionnaire, and then how you're going to adopt, adapt, or develop it. So we need to have an understanding of what your plan is around there. Then also looking at your data collection methods. How are you going to do it? Having a look at your sampling. What sort of sampling are you going to do? For example, whether it's probability or non-probability. And then again, looking at your data analysis approach but only depicting what's going to be used, right? And again, depending on your data, so you might have quite a bit of a flexible model there, depending on, on what you get and what you're seeing. A qualitative approach, um, I think there is a um, preference there that qualitative data, given the time frame and um, given the depth that you might be able to achieve over 12 months, could yield some really interesting findings. So then you've got to look at what is your research design? Are you going to look at doing case studies? Is it going to be interpretive? Looking at who you're going to be working with and what's your justification for that particular group? 
what are your data collection methods going to be? Are you going to do interviews, observation? Are you going to be going through documents? What strategies are you going to ensure to ensure the validity and reliability of what you're doing? Remember the hallmark of really good research is that with your methodology that you conduct your research, if you've done a really robust plan and carried it out, then I can pick up that methodology and do exactly the same and yield exactly the same results more or less. I mean, that, that's the point, right? So really think about that. And that's, I think that's where kind of qualitative data and qualitative research can get quite a bad rep because it is around that validity and reliability and the tendency the researcher has of not being so aware of their own position and their own biases and stuff. And then also looking at the data management of that, of the qualitative data, what's going to be your technique in terms of analysis? Are you going to use discourse analysis? Are you going to use a framework analysis? What are you going to do? It's really important that we have some sense of that because that will help us understand, that will give us a really good insight as to whether you're going to get the right, whether you've got the right methods for, for your questions. So, you know, as I said earlier, there might be, there might be some back and forth that we see potential in your research question, but we've got doubts around your methodology. And there could be a follow-up process where we discuss it with you and talk about maybe taking that out and maybe doing this find out what the costing of that and maybe and looking at stuff like that. So again, there may be that back and forth we talked about earlier. And also a really important thing for me, and it's often something that's not really, I don't think there's a requirement, I think that's what we were saying earlier, there's not a requirement for it, but it's very important that you have to think about the ethical considerations of what you're doing, particularly if you're working with um, learners, uh, particularly those that are, that are young learners. Rama, I know this is something we've talked about. Do you want to take it forward from the ethical considerations uh, part? Yeah, just ethical considerations as well as the quantitative, qualitative uh, approaches. Um, you need to have factor it into both. It doesn't matter which one you're doing. It, 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 uh, it overarches both of them. Yeah, um, yeah. We would we wouldn't recommend in one year, uh, effectively maybe ten months or so, um, a very you know pre post. Uh, kind of uh, design for the quantitative study. But at the same time, if you do a survey that is questionnaire based study, it's so easy to make any number of questionnaires, just administer it and call it research. There are ever so many bad questionnaires based surveys in the country, especially, and we don't want to really encourage that kind of thing. And then, of course, once you have administered a questionnaire, it's very easy to uh, add it up, add frequencies, and calculate averages or standard deviations, or even compute t tests and so on, or that is called inferential statistics, and then make lots of very attractive diagrams. But somehow that hides a lot of uh, important and valuable data, valuable understanding that you could have arrived at through the study. So we really would like you to think of maybe a little more, we are more inclined to qualitative research, where I think you get a or mixed method, or at least a kind of a combination with a little more tilt towards qualitative study. Um, so that's about that. But ethical considerations, Definitely, if it's an empirical study, you know, whether it involves teachers, principals, parents, students, or whoever, or colleagues, do take their consent, and as we call call it informed consent, to explain. You need to explain to them what, what your study is all about, and then collect your data, and then also something called validating it, or in, in research terms, we call it member check. That is, you, if you have interviewed somebody, maybe an adult, then you take back the data to them and ask them if they agree with what they said, what they thought they said. So all those things will have to be done and it is a little time consuming, but that's when you are carrying out credible research. So we would like you to do really high quality research and not a lot of you know, uh, data to look at and to put together and to present and so on, but then good quality research. Uh, we do not have a code of conduct. Uh, there is no permission letter, but then if the study is being printed, published by the British Council, I know we did it as part of another project, then you need to go and get permission 
on a permission letter from students and parents and so on. So it's better to get it now as you do the study. So make sure you can get that kind of consent from people when you plan your study. Or give the, give the you know, chance to people to withdraw from the study or even to say, no, sorry, I don't want to be part of the study. I think that choice should be theirs, should be the participants. Yeah, uh, no account should be forced on people and no, no account should you hide some data and say, no, I'm just getting it for my uh, research. It's okay. All that I think is not, not okay. That's all for now. But I think just to add to this, so I think for us, one of the most exciting prospects of running this scheme is that, you know, it's, it's particularly around these sorts of things that we mm -hmm. accepted into the program. This is where our mentoring support, mm -hmm. where the webinars and sharing our tools amongst each other and getting feedback. So, that, so think of it very much when we work together over the next year, it's about refining, tightening, and you know, really lifting it. So not that all these tools need to be in place at the moment that you're submitting, but just the frameworks of what you're thinking, because that will be much more of a collaborative affair once, the, the, once you're in the scheme. We will be supporting there and there'll be feedback and so forth. And we'll be giving input around how to how to test your tools and how to make sure they're doing what you want they're doing. And also kind of making sure that there's no bias in your tools as well to do what you think there is already existing there. Um, does anybody have any questions around this? I realize it's quite a lot, but I think those are kind of like the key areas that you need to touch upon in your application. Yeah, some questions I've tried to answer. Okay. Um, how many hours for collecting data? This is a very, very, um, what is it? Relative. It's really subjective, it's very hard to... Yeah. And even for the sample size, I've said there's no magical number. You need to, the more the, more, the better, because then it is, you know, reliable. Physical power, yeah. No number, and there's no fixed number possible. But again, as we mentioned right from the beginning, your, your question, your conceptual framework will be very much the driver it yeah. will tell you where your opportunities are, where you're limited. So once you've got that, then it's a question of mapping what you think is going to work and being able to really rationalize that. Why is that the most effective way to get to that, to find the answer to the, the solution to that? Yeah. And similarly, there's another question about the advantages of doing it individually or doing with an institution. What we mean by institutional, with an yeah. institution is, would you like them to be part of this in what way? But it's an individual piece of research. It's not an institutional, it's not institutional research. Am I right, Jemima? It can be affiliated, if you're a researcher that's affiliated to, to a university. So for example, we're working with some consultants at the moment, they've applied for it, mm -hmm. but the contract, the agreement is with the university and then the university gives the funds to, to the to the academics so it all depends on the mechanics of your university and whether you're allowed to work outside of your program as, as your faculty is an independent i understand in india there's many different kind of layers and how it all works is very much dependent upon the institution so i mean it, it really i mean that that's very much that's very much your call Obviously, the association with a higher institution is good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Shall I move on? Yeah. All right. Okay, so... I myself have just come out of studying and I was working on a, I did an MSc, well, I tried to do an MSc in um, educational research um, at a university in the UK. And one of the things we were talking about a lot towards the end of the course is around research impact uh, and looking at the value of that. So that's very much something I wanted to build into our application process. So in the UK, um, they define an organization called Research Councils, defines research impact as the demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy. 
So, and this is a key thing I really want us to do with our scheme. So it's lo looking at academic, I mean, looking at how to achieve research impact. Often, it's normally associated with its academic impact, what it does in terms of the circulation of knowledge in academia, which is great, but I think we've got to think bigger and wider than that. So I think we've got to look at its economic and societal impact as well. And because education research falls under a branch of social sciences, we can also look at research impact in terms of three key areas, which for me are really nicely articulated here. So you're talking about instrumental, influencing the development of policy, practice, or services provision, provision le um, shaping legislation, and altering behavior. So this is great. You've also got the idea of uh, conceptual impact, which is contributing to the understanding of policy issues, reframing debates. And then you've also got the impact of capacity building through technical and personal skill development. So don't just think of your kind of immediate people that you're interacting with. Also think about the indirect impact that your particular piece of research could have. Because I think often we, we forget about that and we kind of look at it in quite a closed way. So I really want you to look at all the possible points where your research could potentially touch and reach. Because once you've identified those, and we'll talk about it later, then you've identified the key people that you need to engage with as part of your dissemination plan. These two are very much invariably linked. So really think about what the impact is that you can have and on whom and how. So really think about instrumental, conceptual, and capacity building. Just to add one small point, uh, in fact, the, the rationale for the study, in fact, is also, is also sort of linked to the kind of impact it will have because it's, the rationale itself defines it. I'm doing this because I want to make an impact on, you know, that kind of thing. I want to build capacity of, say, teachers or teachers in their technical skills or something, and therefore I'm taking up a study. Or I want to teach English, English to some people, and then therefore I'm doing it. And who are the beneficiaries? So that kind of question. So it is a, it's a kind of a loop. But it's also going bigger than that. So if you are working with teachers bigger. and you notice something that that, so that's yeah. great. You've got an evidence that you can then take yeah. on a conceptual level to policymakers to say, look, we've got evidence that this is working. And then from there, you go into your instrumental where you can influence. So it's about positioning what we're doing, how you're doing it, and showing the relevance of it. Not just to ourselves with our own community, because we're aware of it, but how it can touch others. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really, so yes, this is a nice light, small slide, so it's very much around uh, your timetable. And although timetables sound super nice and easy, it's actually got to be really carefully thought through, particularly in terms of the activities that you're going to do. So there's going to be a strong link between your methodology, your timetable and your costing because we when we're reviewing your application we will be flipping through the three of them to make sure that they're linked up that they're that they're well thought through you haven't underestimated you haven't overestimated you're not being too ambitious or you could push yourself further we'll be very much looking at it like that so the key things you need to make sure are factored into your timetable is you need to clearly indicate to the reader what you and your team members, if you're working with others, what you're going to be doing. I would look at this, like what you're going to be doing it each month, and then look at what you're hoping to achieve within that quarter. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you've got to make sure that your timetable and your methodology are linked, and you've got to make sure your plan works. I need to add an S to that slide. So it's not bottlenecked towards the end of the scheme. So if you're working with educational institutions, check school calendars. When are board exams? If there's elections coming this year. Make sure you've factored all of this sort of stuff. 
really don't leave everything to like the last three or four months because otherwise it will be a very stressful process for you and for your mentors who will, you know, who you'll be needing more at that point. Yeah. So think of me, even think of like micro steps, like finalized data collection tools, maybe pilot data collection tools. I mean, think about all the little micro steps that are going to help you get to where you need to be by the end of the scheme. Mm. And then look at your, you know, key roles and responsibilities in terms of who's responsible for those different steps. Yeah. Um, one point that I can add, Jemima. Go for it. Um, is that they might like to think of this whole study as made up of a small pilot followed by a main study, whatever the kind of study. A pilot meaning you're trying to find your feet, you're trying to figure out uh, your, your site, the research site, then your participants and your tools. You might want to sort of administer or pilot your tools and see how it works. So that could be done in the first two months or something. And then you, I mean, there is no fixed time. And then your main study can start. So you, but it, as Jemima said, everything has to be planned in advance. So I would even say work backwards and then see when you should do what. If, if next March is the end of your project uh, with whatever reports and then presentations and dissemination and everything, then how do you do the previous one and then the previous one and so on. That, so this research is all about being very, very systematic. So the more you plan, the better it is. Of course, you will make provision for small changes to happen, but still it will have to be planned. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so for your research outputs, so I think it's important to ensure that your outputs from your research are aiming to inform practice in whatever shape and form that might take. So from research evidence, we know that research is most effectively disseminated using multiple vehicles and ideally with face-to-face -face interaction. And that's very clear in all the research that's done on this. So, you know, I think key points that you should include in this section are, you know, you've got to show to us that you've identified your key audiences. Now, your key audience might be academics, it might be students, it might be teachers, it might be policymakers. Oh, this is going to mistake. They might say, sorry. Um, so really make sure that you can identify that. And then how are you going to engage with different audiences? How you engage with academics is going to be different from how you engage with students, which again is going to be different from how you engage with teachers. So think about all the different ways that you could reach. What's going to be the best fit for that audience? And then what will, what will you use? Will you use you know, a YouTube video? Will you do a workshop? Will you do like a, a panel discussion? What are you going to do to, to reach them? And then really importantly, and often what gets forgotten, is how are you going to measure the success of your research outputs. What processes or systems are you going to put in place to have evidence that you're reaching and people are responding to the work that you're doing? So it's very much about circulating the knowledge and making and choosing a medium that's going to be easily digestible for your audience. So just some key little things here I just wanted to add. So some of your possible activities could include development of links with key organizations, use of electronic media, you've got workshops, you've got webinars, and then you've got the traditional favorites, uh, publications and conferences, which I'm not adverse to, but I'm all, I also think that there's quite an echo chamber going on with those two, with those two. Not saying that there's no space for them at all, but, you know, is that going to work for students? Is that going to work for teachers? You know, is that, you know, is that the right channel for who you want to communicate with? So really think about those things. You know, plan dissemination can be very powerful when it's done well. Rama, is there anything you want to say then? No. <clears throat> 
I think this is the slide I'm dreading the most. I think the next one. Yes, here we are. So, um, the personnel, I think when we, Rama and I were talking about this and we thought we'll try and show you a model of, of one that's been done in the past, but we were unable to find one. Because this seems to be quite a, a problematic area for, for people when they're putting together research proposals. So I thought, you know, I think there are key, there are five key areas that you will need to factor into your costing. You'll need to factor in sort of personnel. You need to factor in your transportation. You'll have to look at how you're communicating, what channels you're using, what's going to be the cost implications of those channels. So are you going to need support with, you know, getting a certain sort of, um, what's the right word? What's that thing on your phone? Data? The amount of data that you can have on your phone are you gonna you know what supplies do you need to carry it out are you gonna need to do a lot of printing are you gonna need to do um are you gonna need to buy anything that's specific to your project and then also think about your dissemination event or events what are you going to do there what are going to be the cost implications around that so i think one of the key things that might be how i kind of envisage us looking at this slide <laughs> would be more around you asking me questions and Rama questions on can I charge for this? Can we cost for that? Are we allowed to cost for this? So obviously we're not going to buy, you know, like pieces of hardware or laptop or digital cameras or stuff like that because we're assuming that that's already in place. But we are happy to look at doing software if you need a specific software that's going to support your research. Remember, your funds are, I mean, not that it's little, but it is 2,500. So think about it carefully. In terms of transportation, can you do that the same on Skype or on Zoom or on WhatsApp? You know, really being quite um, sensible about how you're spending your money. Does anyone have any questions here? Padmini has one question yep. um, about is there a proportionate distribution of funding across the five areas? So, in fact, we, we, we talked, talked about, about we, this, yeah. We, we talked about this, and I, it's, I can't, I wish there was like a nice little matrix where I could say it's 20% on this and 10% on that, but it, but it's not, it's, it's, there's not a perfect kind of parameter for this. I think it's again based on what your study is about, um, how much movement is going to be needed, um, when you're doing it, how are you, how are you going to be communicating with your people that you're working with. I mean, it's really difficult to say. Mm. So no is the, is the short answer there. Yeah. But just be sensible and just, just use, use your common sense. Hmm. Um, yeah, as we said, if, if there's a lot of potential in the proposal and the costing isn't quite uh, appropriate, then I think there will be people in the British Council who will get back to you and then negotiate with you and try to ask you to reduce some things and increase something else and all that negotiation can happen. But at the same time, one thing as an Indian, now this is where Jemima probably <laughs> isn't quite qualified to say something like what I'm going to say. Now, in India, we are used to asking for more than less. And then we usually have this uh, approach or attitude where we say, uh, let's ask for more than anyway, they'll cut it down, but I'll still get half of it or something like that. Many, many of my colleagues, in all any unit I've worked with, or any organization, maybe UGC or ICSR or whatever, they all also work like that. They usually the budget is cut down half or one quarter, but here it's not like that at all. So don't ask for more, and you're not going like you're not likely to get it is one thing, but it also adds work to the team and the British Council because you, they'll need to sit with you and work it out 
So I think if you can take a responsible sort of approach to this, it would be very good. And, and just talking about that, we've got quite a tight turnaround for, for us because we need to have this money um, awarded by the end of the financial year. So it will be quite a tight turnaround. So I, if there is going to be a lot of back and forth and someone's got something that's much simpler and easy for us to go for, then in terms of logistics, then that if we have to choose between one or the other, that could be a deciding factor for us. Yeah. Because we don't want to go into lengthy negotiations around, you know, how much you're going to spend on stationery or how much, you know, you need to do for food when you're bringing people together and so forth. And again, if you've got any specific questions that you want to ask around this and you don't want to ask in this forum, then I'm going to show you an email address um, on, one, on one of the last slides. So feel free if you want advice to come and ask us, you know, write to us directly and we'll be able to help you as best we can. It's also just an add on here. So you see here it's costs and other funding. Previously in the past we've worked with, uh, we've accepted applications where they're already being funded, like there's an element of an other funding coming into the research project. So if we would be co-funding alongside for the, for the same research project. That's also considered. So don't think um, just because you're already doing something, we can also contribute to that too. Obviously, when, if you show us how that's going to work, then that's also, we'll also happily uh, accept that. But again, it needs to be articulated um, in the proposal. Hmm. There are some questions, Jemima. Okay, I was expecting it for this slide. Mm -hmm. um, how should the final research be presented? Is there any page limit or any other specifications? And my yeah. answer to that is, it's not only paper publication or presentation, you can think of many other ways. There's one slide on that, do have a careful look. There is, and I think in terms of, as you saw in some of my headings earlier, so when it goes into proposal details, so all the subheadings that come under there, you're allowed no more than um, six pages. And in terms of like your bibliography and references... No, 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 no. this is not about the, pub, the proposal. It's about the, the report at the end. But, but I, I honestly at this stage... Final research. The final piece of research in terms of your output for the British Council will mostly be evolving around um, your, the presentation that you will give and then what will be, and then how, that is, how that's being received as well. And then also looking at your dissemination plan of what you're gonna be taking responsibility for yourself. If you think writing a, a full report and making it into an open access journal is your best vehicle, then, then that's what you do. But I don't want you to think that you have to produce uh, an academic piece of report as your, as your final output. There are many different outputs that you can do and the report is something you can do on your, in your own time. But as far as I'm concerned, your key output at the end of the scheme will be your presentation. Okay, the other question which won't get answered, I think, to this is, will there be a separate bursary for dissemination, as mentioned earlier? No, as you see here, it comes under the costs. This is something you will do your own dissemination and the British Council will also do the dissemination. Um, Jai Kumar's question, are we allowed to hire other teachers or experts to help the principal researcher? I think it's very clear you, you can have a, uh, another collaborator with you, a second uh, researcher, but you will be the principal researcher. But there is no, there is no costing for this, for high, hiring. You know, when you say hire, that means you will have to pay. I don't think... I think you, could, you can pay for their expenses, but I don't think you can pay them a fee. Yeah. Yeah. And the same would apply to you. You can't pay. It's not a fee that you're getting for doing this, but all your costs should be covered. Yeah. <coughs> Is that the last slide? Nearly. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Are there other questions that people would like to ask? Timeline for what? Padmini's question, what's the timeline? So I'm saying for what? I imagine for the scheme, the scheme is, uh, for, it'll be from April 2019 to March to 2020 with an induction, which will be a day and a half in April. And then a monthly engagement with the team. Anyone else? Yeah. So it runs from April 2019 to March 2020. Yes. With the idea that you present in March 2020. So it's 11 months in theory. Well, 10, yeah, 10 if you take out the induction. Oh, now there's another question. Can the collaborators also attend the induction program? Yes. That will be factored into the travel allowance. As long as they're named on your proposal and we accept their specified role, then yes. Okay. Uh, do uh, talk to your colleagues and friends and ask them to watch this recorded webinar and then maybe apply. We would like to have um, many quality applications. This scheme and arms. What's the difference between this scheme, L trims and arms? I think they're, they're very different. So <clears throat> this program is focused on researchers and academics conducting research. And then they are supported by the British Council and an ELT specialist. <laughs> and arms is about um, uh, arms is about supporting mentors who are working with teachers who are conducting classroom based action research they're very very different the only similarity is the mentoring aspect mm. no the, the mentors in the arms uh, scheme they are going to they are supporting other mentees like the six to eight teachers doing action research in the classroom but it's different from doing this sort of research that we're doing here now. Yeah, the process right. of application, the rigor and the, I think the level, the level of quality and rigor that we're expecting here yeah. in this batch of applications, yeah. very different uh, from how it's framed for the, for the ARMS program, yeah. which is focused on teachers. Remember, that's our primary focus with ARMS. Mm. And this is more around research, like what are the key areas of research? Yeah. what's going to contribute so can the same people be allowed to apply for both in the same year that's the other question can um, i would just say <laughs> as somebody who's been working on the arms project that that's an awful lot of work <laughs> It really, really is uh, an awful, an awful lot of work because at least when you're doing the research, it's very much you're in control of it all. But you've also got the aspect with the arms program is that it's kind of twofold. You're going to be supporting teachers who are doing research, but you yourself are also doing research about how you're mentoring. Yeah. It's kind of, it's multi-layered in that respect. So imagine doing, supporting teachers who are doing research investigating your own ability to mentor teacher researchers and then doing LTREMS as well. I just think it's an awful lot, particularly if you have a full-time job. Yeah. Um, uh, what, when is the ARMS uh, announcement going up? It's gone. It was launched. So what I would suggest to people here, those who are not very conversant with what ARMS is all about, do look at both the announcements and see where, where you want to sort of place yourself again and think about what your role profile is i really do think that the way that we have framed the ltrems program is that we are and as it will say on the web page we're looking for researchers and academics whereas the arms program is looking mostly at teacher educators mm -hmm. and people involved in um sort of day-to-day -day teaching whether that's at a higher education institution but you know you have to be doing sort of regular classroom experience there 
Whereas a researcher could be doing a couple of lectures a week, but kind of doing a bit of research, you know, researching as well and publishing and so forth. Oh, you could be a researcher in a research institution. Mm -hmm. um, okay, they want the link to the recording of the session. Yes. Have given it or are you going to give it? No, what I'm going to have to do is once we finish this, I will upload it onto YouTube and then the YouTube link will be put on the web page. It will be advertised on Facebook, advertised, promoted on Facebook and uh, on Twitter. So if you want to have a look, just go to the web page. It will be up tomorrow by lunchtime. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, Sangeeta Samant is saying this is her first attempt at research work at this level. So some very basic tips she would like to make her proposal focused and uh, how it should, how it will have your, your approval without teachers. So maybe she can write um, and then there is an email ID where she can, she can have her questions answered, right? But also I would say, don't be afraid to show it to people. So if you've got people in your educational community that are familiar with research practices and processes, then get them to you know, cast an eye over it and, and give you feedback on it as well. Because you know, as I, as I said right in the very beginning, it needs to be written in a style that's accessible and understandable. So we don't, as reviewers, we don't have to try and guess what your meaning is, we can just we know exactly what it is that you're saying. But don't be afraid to seek sort of peer feedback. Mm -hmm. Can the collaborator be a PhD student? Yeah, of course. No, but because we are not, this, this scheme is not for PhD and then for students. No, but it's not for people that are, that it, it's not funding their thesis or their research, but they can be a supporter of somebody who's doing research okay. that isn't their own. Yeah. That's fine. And that's clearly communicated on the web page as well. If you look at under eligibility, you, you can be a PhD student, but we're not there to finance your thesis. But if you're doing research around it or on a different avenue or you're supporting somebody who is, that's fine. Yeah. It's coming up to nine o'clock and uh, I've got another meeting later in about 30 minutes. Yeah, I so. don't think there's any question unanswered. Okay. Uh, if there is any, please type it again. So just some key information for you. So the deadline for proposals is the 15th of February at midnight, Indian Standard Time. A link for this recording will be made available on the LTRIMS page, so, and we will send a notification. It will probably be in the column on the right, the right hand side. If you've got any further information or you've got any queries or questions or you're not sure of anything, then please do email us. We're checking the box um, at two points every day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So we will catch it and we will respond. Yeah. Well, it's getting pretty late and I know you've all got, uh, you need to kind of relax for your evening. So I just want to say thank you all very much for attending our session today. I hope you found it helpful and I hope you've got a better sense of what you need to do and what we're looking for in terms of your application. And lastly, I just want to say I, I wish you all the, the best of luck and I hope uh, we get to work with you in the coming year. Yeah. Thanks for me as well and it's, I think it was quite, quite a useful and um, informative kind of a, a discussion. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Whoops, if I can. Hmm. Okay. okay, I'm going to end the meeting, and when I end, you'll all be uh, you'll all be kicked out. <laughs> so uh, have a look. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody.